If you ask AI to create the ultimate futuristic instrument, surprisingly, it's not that different from the classic synth that shaped the industry decades ago. And that's the reason for that. If you are into audio UI design or building better music products, stick around. Because today we are breaking down how these legends didn't just change music. They shaped the way we design audio apps. Welcome to legends that started all this. The very thing that my team has been designing for over a decade. I'm Natalia, let's dive in. To build the future, you've got to understand the past. And in music tech, the past is a technological fashion roller coaster. Take joystick, for example. Why did Roland and Quark double down on this feature while others didn't? How did they shape modern synth UI? And what lessons can we steal to design better products today? To figure it out, we need to rewind back to 1987. Back when Smooth Criminal, Revolution and other iconic tracks were being crafted on this very legends. Let's start with Roland D50. You can spot LA synthesis, first building effects and joystick control, all packed into this beast. Any review you read or even quick chat GPT search will confirm that. And if I miss something, please drop a comment because we are exploring this together. Imagine you are still in those legendary 80s and a lot of cool devices offer features, a lot of features, right on the interface. Then boom, Yamaha's DX7 comes along and lets you save a few presets. Suddenly, instruments are getting more complex, more controls appear and Roland makes it cool by expanding preset storage. This leads to a whole new market for sound designers, IRAS, <laughs> new preset industry, and even cartridge business. Unlike Prophet 5, you don't need to take a snap photo to remember your settings. You just pop in a cartridge. Some of you might look at these steps to save a preset uh, and think that's way too complicated. But honestly, I think it was a smart way to keep your hard-earned presets safe. Losing them in the middle of a tour would be a disaster. And if you check out the all synth on reweb.com after years of touring, you'll, you'll see exactly what I mean. That's why studio-only devices could cost twice as much because they never had to survive the stage. So, Roland taught us how to switch presets. Quark took it to the next level with M1. Just up and down buttons. Simple. And guess what? Modern software like Nexus and Omnisphere thrives for the exact same reason. Presets and powerful sound design. If you want to look visually like some specific era, just look on the screen technology. From no screen to basic red LEDs like in DW8000, then came these two row LED screens. And from there, LED kept evolving. The Roland D50 had a two row LED display, which people complained was too pale, too low in contrast, but at the time, it was the best tech for the price. When Quark launched their workstation just a year later, they used the same LED technology. And live musicians obviously weren't happy. You needed a shade in the sun and preheat in summer. But guess what? Quarter of a million units sold. The lack of competition in that price range played a huge role. When you are designing, emulating a hardware VST plugin, you're literally stacking a screen, inside screen, inside screen. If you get the joke, drop your puns in comments. I read and answer everyone. So what were the absolute must-haves for the synth back then? 
presets, screens, MIDI in and MIDI out, and both Quark and Roland took this seriously. And today, if a synth doesn't have these features, you're in trouble. And speaking of a peculiar must-have. I teased this earlier. The joystick might not have been an essential feature, but it was a cool innovation and became the signature move for both Quark and Roland. Roland stuck with this for decades. Just look at the JD800 10 years later. Yeah, users back then complained, but joystick actually saved space on the panel. A dual functional joystick meant fewer controls, which was a win for the design. There is the same. We judge by appearance, but decide by the mind. Same goes for products. Quark understood this better than anyone and built an entire empire on clever marketing, starting with a demo track. Actually, they did something genius. They sold their synth with a special demo track, competing for attention with a piano sound. And by the time drums kicked in, the M1 was already sold. It was the perfect balance of affordability and rallies. The first preset, universe, and then boom, a realistic piano. This isn't about your UX, my expertise, it's about marketing. In marketing, just like UI UX, dictates the first impression. Minimalism. Quark made an important shift. They moved away from showing all presets on the panel, a relic to analog synth, and introduced a simplified navigation. Up, down buttons for presets, numbers now switch tabs instead of presets, more functions, few controls. This wasn't just in M1, you can see it in the previous models, and minimalism brings us to the next big design trend – fashion. Quark completely ditched the past. They moved from the squares to rounded corners. Minimalism taking to the extreme. Now, I'm going to say circular buttons a couple of times just because it was nothing to represent any previous era. And that circular button, it's backlit. Unlike in DW8000, where buttons and backlighting were separate, this was an innovation. I know, I know, today in plugins you can design whatever you want, but think about it. If you had to stack functions with this logic today, what would it look? What problems would it solve? Let me know in the comments. Quark didn't just beat the competition, they obliterated them. The synth had a synth engine, a drum machine, a sequencer, meanwhile the competitors managing just two-in-one solutions. And while this point is more about product development, I hope it inspires you. Good design isn't just about looks, it's about making products feel essential. Because trends matter, there is a fashion in features, fashion in styles, and even a fashion in approach. And when everyone got tired of knobs on synth, we moved to buttons and screens. When that got old, you know the drill. Just like with Quark, circular buttons that backlit. Right now, minimalism is the trend and people don't have time to tweak all those buttons and knobs endlessly. So where do you think this pendulum is swinging next? I have my guesses, but I want to hear yours. Let me know in a comment. Why does software still look like this? Think about it. Every design is a product of its time. It's shaped by two forces. What's happening inside the company, technology, budget, engineers saying, I can't fit this in on the circuit board. And what's happening outside, the trend, competition, and what musicians actually want or think they want. That's why synth from the 80s look the way they did. And why, when you open a modern VST, you still see echoes of those same design decisions. But here's the thing. 
we are 30 years later removed from that era. Musicians today can barely afford quality hardware. They spend less time at their computers. Some don't even start on a computer. And now AI is entering the game. So if software has no physical limits, why does it still look like hardware? Because while technology evolves, user experience follows a much slower curve. And AI is taught on bingo, the legends. <laughs> Yeah, the industry shifts. Back in the 80s, a synth cost few thousand dollars. Today, that's equivalent to five grand or so, while a plugin now is about $200 per year, and that's the expensive one. And it's not just users. Companies aren't making what they used to. That's why companies milk the biggest hits, and turning them into cash cows. Because when you are desperate, you take risks. When you hit the gold, you play it safe. Music tech moves forward, but never fully breaks from the past. So what's next? That's for us to figure out. And until the next time.